Good evening and welcome to this webinar hosted by Ladue Chapel Presbyterian Church on Restoring the Nature in Your Neighborhood with Mitch Leachman from the St. Louis Audubon Society. Uh, we are so glad you're joining us tonight. Um, we also have joining with us tonight um, Sue Reed, who is a member of Ladue Chapel, and we are so glad that um, she knows Mitch from the Audubon, St. Louis Audubon Society. Um, so, Sue, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you so that you can um, introduce Mitch and our topic for this evening. Thank you very much, Mel. It's wonderful to, I wish we could see everybody out there, but it's wonderful to see names on the screen. So we're glad that you're joining us tonight. And I thought it just uh, was perhaps why I am involved in this at all. Um, I have been a gardener my entire life, which is a very long life nowadays. Uh, I've been a very enthusiastic gardener, trying to make my yard um, friendly to wildlife as I knew it back in the old days. But it's only about six years ago that I turned into a native gardener enthusiast. And Mitch is one of those that helped me do that, along with Doug Tallamy. And I know you're going to be hearing about Doug Tallamy, too. Um, it's just been a wonderful experience because I've been growing a lot of plants that I didn't have any idea what they were before. And I found that there are some beautiful plants that are native plants and useful to birds and bees and butterflies. And um, it's just been a very exciting thing. One of the things that was really helpful to me was the Bring Conservation Home Program, which Mitch started here in St. Louis through the St. Louis Audubon Society. And it's, it's a wonderful program. I, I know he's going to tell you a lot more about that and how, and maybe, you know, why is the Audubon Society interested in native plants and that sort of thing. So um, Mitch is the director of programs for the St. Louis Audubon Society. Um, he is the coordinator for the Bring Conservation Home Program, which is a very volunteer-oriented program where people actually come out to your home, and that's very unusual. Um, I know he's going to be full of all information, and he has beautiful pictures to share with you. So thank you for coming, Mitch, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Sue, uh, and thanks, Mel, uh, and of course, thanks to Ladue Chapel for the invitation uh, tonight. Um, so uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the community, um, and Sue's support over the years has been tremendous, uh, and I've been so pleased to see her, her garden develop um, further uh, from what it was when we first met. Um, so uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get into things. I'm gonna turn on my screen sharing um, so you all get to see what we want you to see. So I'll give this a minute, just a, a couple of seconds, I should say. Um, so um, restoring the nature in uh, our neighborhood is the subject of the talk and um, I, it is an introduction. I mean, let's be real clear. Um, uh, e even if um, we had an hour and a half or two hour time slot, uh, there'd be a whole lot that we still wouldn't touch on um, uh, in this, you know, 30, 45 minutes or so that we're going to spend tonight. Uh, it's really just a top level introduction to the concepts, um, uh, some, some concrete actions that you can take uh, in your own uh, space, your own community, your own neighborhood. Um, uh, but uh, um, it, it, it hopefully will inspire you to want to know more. Uh, it will encourage you to do some things again directly, uh, but I'm also going to be uh, pretty heavy uh, at the end on a number of resources. Um, uh, since it is just an introduction uh, and we can't therefore provide you, you know, uh, 10, 12, 15 steps to take, those resources are gonna be really important, so I will talk to those for a bit. Now, on this title slide, um, don't typically spend a lot of time on a title slide, but um, I will um, tonight just uh, help uh, explain the fact that we got three logos on here. You've already learned that I work for the St. Louis Audubon Society, and so we have my employer's logo, the Bring Conservation Home Program. Uh, Sue also already mentioned 
Uh, that is a program of St. Louis Audubon, uh, and we created it about eight years ago. Um, and that will be one of the resources. So we will talk more about that program again toward the end. Um, but you also have the Missouri Department of Conservation's logo on this slide. First of all, they are a resource. They are a tremendous resource for so many of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, and I will come back to them at the end uh, as one of those resources. Um, but also it's really important to give a shout out to them because they are a sustaining funder for our Brain Conservation Home Program. Uh, they, they provide annual financial support um, it, it is a, um, an important, although fraction, of our expenses. So we have a number of ways in which we raise money for the program, um, but their funding is, is extremely important to continue work. So getting into things, um, and, and as I do this, oh, by the way, a reminder about that Q&A, right? So don't forget to use that Q&A button on the bottom. So nature's amazing, right? I mean, you know, let's just make sure we start uh, in the right place. I mean, you know, Ledoux, Ledoux Chapel sponsorship and, you know, creation, right? So what, what better place than to just say, you know, we have black swallowtail caterpillars that become really amazing butterflies, but they're awfully cool just as caterpillars. Um, we have eight spotted forester moths. And yeah, sometimes names make sense. Count the spots. It's an eight spotted forester moth. So um, we have uh, American lady butterflies, or at least I think that's what this is. Um, you do presentations long enough and sometimes things escape your memory, but it is on a New England aster. I do know that for sure. And it is a butterfly and we know that for sure. As I share these photos, uh, one of the reasons to share them is uh, I've taken nearly all of the photos, um, but most importantly, every critter that you're looking at was found and seen in my yard in the little tiny suburban landscape in Maryland Heights uh, that I call home. Um, by the way, uh, that's a gray tree frog. So we have, we have butterflies, we have moths, we have frogs. We have beetles, red milkweed beetles, longhorn red milkweed beetles, one of my favorite little critters in the garden. Um, hummingbird moths. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a hummingbird? Is it a moth? It's a hummingbird moth, a clear wing hummingbird moth, possibly a snowberry clear wing moth. Talk about a cool name. Um, and yeah, birds, right? You know, the Audubon Society, we do, we do care about birds, and this is a summer tanager. Every one of these critters has been seen in our tiny little landscape. And so nature in the neighborhood, and I hope to inspire you tonight on how you can do simple things to have some of those very same critters in your own personal space. So, so it is very important. We're gonna spend a little bit of time here talking about some not so exciting things, but really important to understand how critical it is that we do stuff, we do, we take action. We do whatever we can in our personal lives, in our homes, in our workplaces, that we talk to friends, neighbors, relatives, that we sound the alarm, that we take action on behalf of nature. Because it just really needs it. For example, Okay, you know, what's the problem, right? You know, why, are, why should we be concerned? Well, we live in homes, we live in neighborhoods, we live in developments. Uh, this happens to be a Google satellite photo from St. Charles County. So this is local. Um, doesn't look like a wildlife friendly nature scape to me, looks like a whole bunch of lawn. Um, and just to reinforce the fact that we're adding more lawn all the time, this is right next door. So this is the neighborhood that's been around for 10, 15, 20 years. This is right next door. They're building another neighborhood, another development. Um, a study that NASA did back in 2005 tallied an estimated 63,000 square miles of lawn in the United States of America, 63,000 square miles. That sounds like a lot, but what does it mean? It means nearly the area of Missouri. So across the US of A, we have lawn, lawn 
that, that all put together would take up nearly the space of Missouri. We have highways and roads, right? We're constantly building, we're resurfacing, we're expanding, we're, we're adding more. Um, a study that was done by the University of Georgia uh, also about 15 years ago tallied over 40,000 square miles if you added up all the roadways and that is nearly Ohio. So this is some big, big impact. I mean, you see a road and you don't think big deal, but when you add it all up, it's huge. And of course, we're applying chemicals uh, in all sorts of ways throughout our society. Um, a study that was done, and you might note, as I refer to these studies, that very few of them are recent. I mean, these are 10, 15, 20-year-old studies. And the point there is, so if it was 63,000 square miles in 2005, well, 15 more years of development, you know it's significantly more than that. So uh, the US EPA uh, had gathered data from the chemical industry and tallied an estimated 1 billion pounds of pesticides were applied across the US back in 1998-99. Um, six times that were being applied globally. So some of you may know exactly what this is. Um, it's not always obvious depending upon sort of your experience suite. Um, because I'm a bird nerd, um, I, I recognized this as soon as I saw the graphic online and this was an imprint of a bird. Um, uh, birds typically have, uh, quote, dust uh, in their feathers. And so uh, when they collide with a window, they can leave an imprint and it's that dust that, that came off of them uh, and is left on the window um, uh, in their image. Um, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Smithsonian, um, not that many years ago, estimated uh, at least a half a billion birds die in the U.S. every year by flying into windows, by flying into buildings. Um, and the same folks uh, at Fish and Wildlife Service in Smithsonian um, estimated uh, over 2 billion birds are killed every year in the U.S. by free-roaming cats. Bear with me, but it's really, really important to understand the gravity of our situation, right? Because we haven't even talked about climate change and global warming, right? I mean, all of those issues I just shared with you, every one of those factors, every one of those human impacts, those are, those are happening as we speak. And then, oh, by the way, layer on top of that a warming planet. Um, so it maybe shouldn't be surprising with all of that information that a consortium just last year of um, National Audubon, the American Bird Conservancy, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Smithsonian again, a whole uh, group of organizations got together um, and estimated that we've lost nearly 3 billion birds. And by losing them, let me say that differently, the populations of the birds across North America have declined by nearly 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That is really, really huge number, and that is really, really concerning. Um, also last year, National Audubon, so that's looking backwards. That's looking at history, that's looking at data, citizen science, bird surveys, breeding bird surveys, gathering all of that data together, um, looking forward, modeling that information, that history, and then looking forward with climate models. And National Audubon uh, put out a, a climate uh, study last year and estimated uh, we, we have something close to two thirds of the bird species in North America at risk. So, so some may literally be at risk of extinction. Many are certainly at risk of, of, of dramatic population declines, um, you know, in, in everything that goes with that. So, so wrapping it all together um, was the World Wildlife Fund 
um, that puts out a, a report roughly every two years they call the Living Planet Report. Uh, you can read the factors here. I'm, I'm not going to recite them to you. And yet, look at that last one. Look at that. I mean, a likely conservative estimate that nature's services are worth over $100 trillion a year. So, so even from a monetary standpoint, right, if you cared nothing about the wonder of creation, just the, just the economics of it screams, do something, right? Take action and make a difference because we can. And, and, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't um, come here tonight. I didn't accept the invite. I, I didn't welcome all of you to just bring you down and depress you. But it is important that we understand how critically, critically, uh, you know, uh, it, it is essential that we get involved, that we take action, we do things to conserve the nature that we all depend upon. The, the services that were being referred to in that last slide, right? Clean water, clean air. I mean, we are a part of nature. We are a part of the environment. So, so what can we do? Well, well, don't do this, right? Um, or do less of this, right? That's, that's the, that's the, 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 the more honest way to say it. Um, uh, because uh, you could be proud of this. Uh, you could have accomplished something uh, with a neat and green and tidy lawn. Um, but most importantly, I say, don't let this be the only thing you have in your landscape, right? Because you can do more with your landscape. After all, you're paying taxes on it, right? You know, so if all you got is neat, green, and tidy, and you're paying taxes on every square foot of that, why not be inspired by it, right? Why not have cool critters coming to your landscape as we were showing with the intro slides? Um, and you can still have neat and tidy, right? You can do little island beds. Um, these folks, uh, uh, I can assure you, the longer they live in their house, the less turf grass they have in their backyard is significantly different than their front yard. But still, in the front yard, they're like, we're going to have nature. We're going to have wildlife. We're going to have, uh, you know, cool and important things going on. Much smaller space, um, less lawn in this yard, but still some lawn. Uh, uh, hardscape, boulders, rocks, um, you know, really neat and inviting uh, and, again, inspiring uh, landscape. Um, look, I love this one. I love this slide. I love this photo. This was also one of our garden tours, but it's, it's plants, it's critters, it's grass, it's people, it's a fire pit, it's a patio, right? I mean, this is an inviting space for people as well as wildlife, as well as nature, right? Um, it's not, this isn't one or the other, right? I mean, we live on this planet and you inhabit your home, your landscape, your community. Um, and again, uh, you know, I'm hoping to push you to realize, you know, do things to draw nature in and make your own space that much more interesting and more exciting to experience yourself. I really like this one too. Uh, this also came from our garden tour a couple of years ago. Um, small lot, um, small city lot. This is, uh, this is near the garden. Um, and look, they still have grass. There's still grass here. I don't know if you can see it, but up here next to the sidewalk on the upper level, um, there is some grass, there's some patio stones, some paver stones, um, but they've got one of these slopes, right? You know, look to the left and the right. You know, one of these annoying slopes in so many of the, the neighborhoods and in, in, uh, in homes in the city, in some of the inner suburbs, Maplewood, Richmond Heights, they have a whole bunch of little um, lots like this. And these folks were like, you know, yeah, we're tired of mowing that. So they made it nature. They made it wildlife friendly. Um, and, and I just think it's awesome. Here's another space with, with people and, um, you know, a little water, a little pond, uh, this owner wanted to put in more shade going on in this space. Um, but, uh, again, uh, you know, very inviting, uh, nature as well as people. All of those spaces, what I have in common, what they have in common is native plants. So we're going to talk a little bit here, give you a little bit of a science lesson 
uh, and talk about the critical importance of to draw nature in, to, to take action and do good for nature, um, bring in native plants. Um, you need native plants, and I'm going to talk about birds here for a bit. Um, again, we are Audubon, and birds are uh, our forte. Um, but even though I'm going to focus on birds and talk about them in a little bit uh, of detail, um, it's about restoring the food web. What here, the next few slides, it's all about using native plants to restore nature by recreating the food web. The food web that for the most part doesn't exist with traditional landscaping. That neat and green and tidy turf grass lawn and boxwoods and so on. So, so birds, all of our birds eat insects. Look at this, look at these cardinals. You know, for those of you with, with traditional seed feeders, right, bird feeders in the backyard, you may have never seen this. Um, you know, you see the cardinals come and eat the sunflower seed, um, but in fact, they eat insects, they eat caterpillars, like nearly every one of the songbirds in Missouri, Illinois, and throughout the US of A, uh, these wonderful birds that we know and love, um, they require insects because they need the protein. Insects for birds the size of songbirds, insects are the single most available source of protein for their growth and development. So not surprising, growth and development. So feeding babies, right? So baby birds are stuffed full with insects. That's what the adults are doing, flying around when babies are on the nest, they're looking for insects to come and, and feed them to their babies because that's where they're gonna get all their protein. So, so just, just to connect some dots, so I mentioned the, the, the seed feeder. So, so there's nothing wrong with the seed feeder um, and even during the breeding season, even with babies on the nest, the adults may be visiting your seed feeder. This is not contradictory. That's just illustrating that the adults are not actively growing and the adults are just fine with the carbohydrate-centric food in your seed feeder. But they're not taking the seeds to feed the babies the babies need the protein of the insects. So, so the adults may come and eat seeds, that's fine, that's easy, that's available, that's a drive-through, that's perfect for them, and then they're gonna go look for insects to go back and feed their babies. So we talk about caterpillars a lot, I got a few slides here that will emphasize the value of caterpillars. These are butterfly and moth uh, larvae, right? This is the young stage of butterfly and moths. Um, uh, not because these are the only insects uh, that are eaten, um, but because they are really, really prevalent. Um, there's lots of species out there. There's lots of diversity. Um, they're soft bodied, you know, they're slow moving, right? They don't fly away like a beetle would, right? If a bird wanted to try to catch a June bug, you know, that's a lot of work. Um, but a fat juicy caterpillar um, is very, very uh, good. So, so again, if we like birds, we want to rebuild the food web. We need to support insects. Um, just to sort of um, dramatically illustrate how many insects we're talking about, there was a study that was done uh, watching uh, a family of chickadees. Um, and the study uh, over just a couple of weeks, because most of our songbirds uh, go through the entire process of from laying eggs to fledging in just about a month. Um, so the, the, bird, the baby bird feeding period is about half of that, about two weeks. So, so for most small songbirds, uh, it's about a two week period of this intense feeding. And for those of you on the call that have had the good fortune of actually watching a songbird nest, right? Seeing the adults coming to and from that nest, you're likely looking at these numbers right now and kind of going, yep, I never did the math, but I believe that math. That makes sense to me because you've seen this dawn to dusk feeding operation, which is just insane. Um, and of course it ends up with thousands of caterpillars just for one family of chickadees. So um, we said it's about native plants um, uh, and coming back to plants. Uh, the reason is specialization. Um, it turns out in nature, um, uh, especially when it comes to things that eat plants, 
um, you end up uh, having an intense array of specialization for critters that eat plants. Um, and insects are no exception to that. And you see the figure here, uh, basically nine out of 10 insects have specialized to eat one or a few types of plants. Um, and unfortunately, as you likely know, but we emphasized with some of the photos earlier, we filled our landscape uh, since World War II, really, with the suburbanization of America in building all of our neighborhoods, building all of our neat green and tidies, our nursery industry has been filled with introduced non-native plants, um, and our insects don't know how to eat them. They didn't evolve with those plants. So it, it's, it's about specialization, it's about an evolutionary relationship, and again, if we want to support the birds, we need the insects, to feed the insects, we need the native plants. Um, just a couple of neat photos reinforcing about the birds eating the insects. And yes, hummingbirds as well. Um, so those hummingbird feeders, again, nothing wrong with them, but now recognize that you're feeding the adults high octane sugar water. Um, after all, adult hummingbirds are visiting flowers uh, during the breeding season when the flowers are in bloom. But again, again, the adult hummingbirds are not actively growing. So, so just getting pure carbs is not a problem for the adult hummingbirds. But as soon as they fuel up and they got babies on the nest, they're going to go look for insects. They're going to go look for tiny little spiders, gnats, small caterpillars, and feed their babies, stuff it down their gullet with the high uh, protein um, uh, insect food. So a couple of slides here. Um, that, and oh, by the way, uh, this is being recorded. I don't think we had mentioned that yet, but these are great graphics because they show numerically the critical importance of those native plants using this caterpillar uh, meter, if you will. Um, we talked about the critical importance of the butterflies and moths, and you're looking here at the number of different species of butterfly and moth caterpillars have been seen feeding on each type of plant. So you have common non-native plants on one side and you have common native plants on the other side. And just really, really quickly, easily, and visually, you see the tremendous value of the native plants supporting the insect diversity required for that food web versus the non-native plants supporting little, if any, of that same diversity. This is just giving you the same information, just drilling in more deeply uh, and giving you more examples of those native plants with woody shrubs and trees on the left side and then herbaceous plants on the right side. And uh, Sue had mentioned Doug Tallamy earlier and I will shout out to him uh, also one more time later when we get into resources, um, but you see uh, him referenced here. All of this data comes from his work, his lab's work, his students' work uh, over the years. So that's kind of obvious, but it's good to reinforce it, right? So holes in leaves is inspiration. Holes in leaves is nature at work. Holes in leaves uh, is you're doing the right thing, right? Insects are eating plants and their food for the rest of the web. And these neat, tidy, low maintenance, nothing going on plants from other continents that were introduced like boxwoods and Japanese alcova, they're neat, green, and tidy, and there's just not a lot of inspiration going on there. So all of that stuff about insects, um, needless to say, birds eat other stuff too, right? So insects are essential during the breeding season, right? During the summer months, during the reproduction cycle, but especially in the other seasons, fruit is really, really important. Uh, here's a cedar waxwing eating service berry, a really neat small native tree. Um, here we've got a baby robin also eating service berry fruit um, because that fruit, fruit from native plants, uh, is a really, really important food in the fall and winter, especially. Now, service berry is a summer, arguably even spring food, uh, late spring. Um, but uh, the, the fruit from native plants is especially important uh, during fall migration and then for overwintering, right, for birds that stay here uh, during the, the non-breeding season 
Uh, and again, uh, these graphics will be obviously available uh, in the recording. Um, uh, quick point, these are not the only plants that are native that provide fruit. These are just a good assortment that are all commercially available, that are pretty easy to find, that come in different sizes and shapes, that fit uh, shade versus sun landscape. So it's just a, a good representative sample. So insects, fruit, well, seeds, duh, right? I mean, you know, bird feeding. I mean, where'd the whole sunflower seed thing come from? Well, it came from watching what birds were doing in the wild. So uh, here we have a goldfinch, American goldfinch, uh, pulling out seeds from a native Coreopsis flower. Uh, one of my favorites and one of the more reliable plants uh, to see goldfinches eating the seeds from. Um, our native sunflowers. Uh, we have a number of native sunflowers uh, that are available in uh, the, the native uh, industry trade. And this is a goldfinch eating seeds of a native cup plant, one of our native sunflowers. Um, and then talk about winter, right? So in the middle of winter, birds are especially, again, looking for the fruit and the seeds. And this is a white-throated sparrow perched on some New England aster. They were taking the seeds off of the aster flower in the middle of winter. Uh, similar graphic, again, uh, not all of the plants that provide seeds, um, but a good representative sample of them um, and provide, again, different uh, landscape uh, options for you. There's some grasses on here, perennial flowers, uh, even some woody plants. So it goes without saying, I hope, I hope this is obvious, these two slides, these two graphics, I hope it's obvious that, you know, you can't feed the birds the seeds on your native plants if you do this, right? If you do the fall cleanup and cut everything back, then there's nothing for them to eat. So this is plant material through the winter, waiting for the birds to come find it in the off season. If you want to do neat and tidy, just do it in the spring, right? Just do it as the new plants start to push out, right? As the growth starts to come in and the birds are finding those insects, finding other foods. Um, so we, we need the native plants, right, to, to, to restore nature, uh, to, re, to feed the birds, to restore that food web. Uh, we need the native plants. So here's seven actions you can take, uh, and I'm going to touch on three of these. Uh, so native plants is on here, right? That is one of the items, uh, and I'm going to talk about three more real quickly. So um, again, this may be obvious to many of you, but um, the, the most, this is a great photo because it's a reminder that if you do nothing when you have a quote pest problem, and this is assuming the pest problem is in your landscape, right? I mean, if you've got termites in your house, if you've got ants in the kitchen, you know, I mean, you know, again, a personal interior, uh, 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 you know, uh, issues, uh, you know, do what you have to do. And I'm not going to sit here and criticize whether or not you take a chemical alternative for the house. But in your landscape, you know, this is a great photo because it's a reminder that, you know, nature eats nature, right? You know, predator and prey. I mean, you know, we're just talking about birds eating caterpillars. Well, some caterpillars are certainly considered pests. You know, uh, if a caterpillar is eating your tomatoes or your squash, you know, you may applaud you may not know that it wants to turn into, you know, a sphinx moth or a hummingbird moth, um, that hornworm, um, but you may applaud when the cardinal comes down and starts eating uh, some of the, the caterpillars. That's what nature does, right? Nature will, will find, I, I don't want to say a balance, but uh, it's this give and take. Um, so, so avoid pesticides uh, everywhere possible and look for organic options, look for simple options, look for removal options. You know, Japanese beetles, when they show up in my yard, for example, Japanese beetles are not surprisingly a introduced insect. Um, uh, when they show up in my yard, um, uh, I don't get out any pesticide. 
I simply get a bucket of soapy water and I go out early in the day and I knock them off the plants into the bucket of soapy water and drown them. Um, you know, simple, chemical free. Uh, we talked about windows earlier uh, in the uh, hundreds of millions of birds that, that die in the U.S. every year by flying into windows. Very, very simple fixes the problem windows. Unfortunately, most homes and businesses have some problem windows. Fortunately, especially at the residential scale, most of our windows are not a problem. It's certain ones. It's based on the reflection. It's based on the type of window. There's a whole bunch of factors at work, but here's just a few quick examples of very inexpensive and very highly effective fixes to those. Uh, and these are easy to find online as well. Cats, I meant another reason I did the shout out to the photo bomb is not just because I love cats, but because I knew we were going to talk about them again. And I really do like cats. Keep them indoors, or if they're gonna be outdoors, then supervise them, keep them on a leash, or give them a space of their own that is also outdoors. This is a catio, this is an outdoor patio. Um, so, so fixed, enough said, right? Um, if you wanna know more about those three things or the three things we didn't talk about, they're on the seven steps, go to 3billionbirds.org. These are the six organizations that participated in that study that was published last year and lots of good stuff there online through that website and then through the partner websites as well. So now wrapping up and giving you some specific resources on the, that plant thing, right? That gardening thing, that landscaping thing. Um, so do it yourself. Do it yourself. Resources are always beneficial. And th these two are especially helpful, just like the 3 billionbirdsorg um, These are especially helpful for those of you that may not even be in the St. Louis area. I mean, you know, after all, miracle of social media and technology, we could have people on the call right now uh, that are in another time zone, um, right? So, so, or you're here on vacation, whatever. But, but these are two websites for North America. Um, and you go to these websites and you can type in your zip code uh, and you'll get a whole array of options where you can select native plants and find out what native plants would work in your space. If you like to read, as I do, um, uh, if, um, but this is a small array of really valuable native plant, native landscaping, uh, you know, uh, uh, naturescaping, wildlife oriented books. Um, and look, here's that Doug Tallamy guy again come up a couple of times. We got two books on here from him. His first book, Bringing Nature Home, uh, from uh, a dozen years ago, 14 years ago. And then the book he just released this year, Nature's Best Hope. Um, so wrapping up with uh, the Bring Conservation Home Program and then a few other websites, I urge you to check into these other three entities. I mentioned the Conservation Department earlier. Um, Wild Ones is a really cool local garden club for native plant enthusiasts. Um, and we partner with them on a lot of stuff. Grow Native is a regional nonprofit program for the lower Midwest. Uh, and they have an amazing array of resources for native plants. Um, and then our Bring Conservation Home program. Uh, so this is what we did for eight years. So for eight years, we would come to your landscape as part of the Bring Conservation Home program. And we would hang with you for a couple hours, uh, look at your landscape, take notes, look at the site conditions, talk about your goals and your interests, see what the opportunities are to improve your space for nature and for birds and for wildlife. Um, and then we turn around and provide a detailed written report with the recommendations on how to make that happen. Um, so we still do the detailed written report, but with the coronavirus still um, uh, at large, um, our consultations are actually by video call. So it's still just as detailed. You still get the same level of support, um, but we're just respecting the concerns over the virus um, and managing it with the technology. So uh, we have visited with about 1,300 people in eight years. Uh, we've got about nearly 300 that have achieved certification through our program. Uh, and I'm not sure I'd like to think that they're smiling and they're really excited because they got the yard sign and the certification, but I think they're smiling and they're really excited. 
because they know how cool their landscape is, because they know how inspirational and how amazing it is to go out and visit with the critters that they see all the time. So um, I have one slide here that gives some contact info. Uh, this is one where maybe you make a note or what have you. I'm not hard to get a hold of because my contact info is also uh, uh, pretty public. Um, uh, and, and I'll just pause for just a sec because then I'm gonna go one last slide, um, which is my, my message slide to leave you with, and then we'll see what we have for questions. Um, so contact info, there it is. Again, it's a regional program um, and, and all sorts of details on our website for the Marine Conservation Home Program. And by the way, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I have to point out, there is like one of the biggest earthworms I've ever seen being held by the Cardinals fan here, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the girl, the Cardinals fan, and you know, oh, if only we had baseball going on, right? Um, but she's got a big giant earthworm she's really proud of here. So um, I can't say it any better. We talked about the, you know, the concerns, the, the issues, why we need to do this, but I'll let a couple of our homeowners talk to you here with two quotes. I can certainly add to that, that uh, I feel the same way. And that's, I get so excited about my own landscape. And Mitch has been out to my garden twice to assess it. And it was very exciting to have him come. And now I'm at the platinum level, which is the top level. Um, he didn't mention that, but there's a silver, a gold, and a platinum level. And you can keep trying to get them. All right. Well, Mitch, thank you so much for some wonderful information. Um, you've already answered a couple of the bird questions that we've had, um, but we have a handful of questions about um, recommendations um, that they're wondering what you can recommend. So we have one from Linda, who's a Ladue Chapel member, and who says that uh, in the second, she's in the second year developing a half acre prairie with DJM Ecology. She's wondering if you can recommend native ground covers for fence lines to help crowd out aggressive grapevines and Asian honeysuckle. Yeah, so I'd say a couple things. Uh, one, I just learned today about a plant uh, that I didn't know existed. Uh, I don't have the botanical name, I'm sorry, but I, I'm hoping you can find it pretty easily online and the DJM folks would likely know about it. It's called Prairie Sedge. Um, so that's important because sedges are really, really effective ground covers when they're happy. Um, and, and to find out that there's one that grows in prairie conditions, uh, sunny and dry, that was pretty exciting. Um, as far as the fence line goes in grapevine, um, nothing will stop that from happening. Um, uh, I have learned to hate the fence lines at our house um, and, and it's a simple fact that birds will have eaten a seed of something uh, and, and wild grapes are everywhere and they are native plants and they're very popular bird food and then the birds will perch on that fence they will poop out the seeds and you'll have more grapes um, there's just no no uh, uh, guarantee uh, for that okay. what else all right, so there's, um, and actually this, that helped me because uh, somebody else act, asked about a sedge and I had not heard of that before. Do you have any preferred sedges for full sun for the tree lawn or other low growing natives that can be used as well? Yeah, yeah, so that prairie sedge, again, that was new to me. I mean, uh, and, and it came from, uh, some of you may know the name Dave Tilka. There was a book uh, on that array a few slides back. Uh, native landscaping book uh, by Dave Tilka. Uh, he's quite a personality and he, he co-created this program with us. Um, it was Dave's house that had the prairie sedge. So there you go. So that's one option. And it, it wasn't a very large plant. So, so that would certainly work for a tree lawn. Um, okay. uh, flowering plants. Um, uh, there's a number of cool options. Uh, I am a huge fan of our native petunia. Um, Ruelia humilis, uh, hairy wild petunia, um, loves sunny and dry, um, and it blooms continuously for at least eight, maybe ten weeks or more. It's possible we even get three months out of it. It's already in bloom uh, at our house, and we use it in full 
complete harsh sun right next to the driveway. It gets baked all day long and it just loves it there. Um, I think the tree loan would be a perfect spot for it. So those are a few options for the tree loan. Great. Um, I can add that one, that one and many of the others. Uh, if you have them long enough, if you have them, you know, three or more years, they've pretty much filled in the gaps between everything and you pretty much have very few weeds anymore. It's really, really fun. And the wild petunia, which Mitch just talked about, is definitely one of those plants that just fills in and weeds have no chance, right? Or very little chance. Yeah, yeah. And, and thanks Sue for that, uh, because I didn't say the word ground cover in talking about the tree lawn, but but the, the, the petunia does function as a ground cover for us, absolutely. Okay, um, and then another question, any suggestions for replacing boxwoods in front of the house, keeping below or at window height, preferably bushes that are evergreen so the front looks somewhat good even in winter? Yeah, so very, very common question. Uh, and unfortunately, we've, we've, been, we've, we've been convinced uh, through the nursery trade and through decades, uh, we've been convinced that, that evergreen shrubs are, are the thing to have. And, and I guess I should say that slightly differently. We've been convinced that, that birds in, in nature need evergreen shrubs. But in this part of the world, nature didn't grace us with evergreen shrubs. There isn't a single evergreen shrub that's native to this part of the world. And so first, it's just to say from a, from a nature and ecological standpoint, wildlife doesn't need that evergreen shrub. Now, from a gardening and landscaping standpoint, if you're like, well, I'd really like to retain something like that. Well, I understand. Uh, so, so one uh, is to consider winter interest that's not green. So for example, native grasses. Native grasses can be really dramatic in the winter. Uh, uh, some of them have some pretty interesting colors that hold through the winter. So that's a thought. Um, the other thing is uh, a plant that may drop its leaves. One of my favorites uh, and is very adaptable and it's not very large and that shrubby St. John's wort, uh, Hypericum prolificum um, is the botanical name. Uh, it's in bloom right now. It blooms in the middle of summer. And even though it drops its leaves, it has a very long leaf on period, a very dense shrub. And in the middle of winter, it holds its upright teardrop shaped seed heads all winter long. So you do have something of interest to look at. Um, the, the, uh, the last thing I would say is if you really, really want an evergreen, um, look to a juniper or a, a um, uh, arborvitae uh, species. Uh, there are, first of all, junipers, broadly speaking, are native to North America, uh, although the nursery varieties won't be uh, the actual wild species, but it'll be close. Um, and then arborvitaes, there are some of those that are native to North America as well. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you some options. Great. What else? Uh, any recommendations for native plants for a shady yard? So as you may know or expect, uh, there are fewer options uh, of native plants for full shade than full sun, but there are options. Uh, and and there's, there's more options the, the more years go by as the native landscaping industry continues to develop. They literally find more plants in the wild that they're able to successfully cultivate and grow for distribution. Um, so so there, there's, there's literally too many to just like, you know, rattle some off. Uh, and I don't know anything else about your situation. So I don't want to just offer a few that are quote, really cool. Um, but, but trust me, there are plenty. And oh, by the way, this is a good opportunity to give a shout out to the Missouri Botanical Garden as another resource. I didn't include it on the previous slides, but if you've never used the plant finder, through Mobot, it's very easy to find, it's very easy to use, and they have a they're very detailed advanced search function. You could tell it, I want Missouri natives, and then you could click on how big the plant, what type of plant, what growing conditions, and so on. Great. Um, and and we, can I lead, can I add one more, yeah. more resource uh, that I don't think was mentioned on any of those, and that's the Missouri Wildflower Nursery 
in Jefferson City or south of Jefferson City. It has the most wonderful catalog. It's my favorite catalog of all catalogs. It has so much information about each individual plants and um, it's online, I believe, as well as in print. So that's one that um, could give you an awful lot of information and it breaks down plants by shade, by sun, by wet, by dry, lots of different ways it's, it's uh, Absolutely. helps you. Absolutely, very good, thank you for that. All right, what do you recommend we do with an acre of honeysuckle? Uh, yeah, so, so, so I actually have a very inspirational response to that. Um, uh, visited with a homeowner in St. Charles, uh, Weldon Spring area, just, just a couple days ago. Um, and essentially by herself, this is one middle-aged uh, uh, mother. Um, and with, within the last year, she had cleared her property of bush honeysuckle. I, I can attest to the fact she cleared it because I was there after it was done. Um, and, and the lot was one acre. The woods that was filled with honeysuckle was about half that. And she had already started in on one of her neighbors and uh, their older neighbors. And she was literally starting to clear their property and she had inspired the other neighbor to start clearing their own. Um, so, so it looks daunting. I, I've killed a, a countless number of honeysuckle shrubs myself, uh, coordinated volunteer projects at, at public parks and, and spaces. Um, it is a lot of work, but it can be done. Uh, you don't have to use chemical herbicide depending upon what you're doing and the scale of it, you may choose to use the chemical herbicide to ensure you're actually killing the plant, but um, do not in any way think uh, it's impossible task. Do not in any way think you have to hire it out, um, but that is also an option. Should you have some financial means, there are a number of companies out there. If you wanted specific referrals for removal of honeysuckle, Again, you can instant message us on Facebook. Um, you could use my contact info that's here on the slide right now. Great. Uh, we have another question about, I had an indigo bunting at my feeder this year. What native plant do they like? Oh, gee, that's a very good question. Uh, indigo buntings do not uh, stay here in the winter. They are a neotropical migrant uh, and they have to go south in order to continue to find insect food in the winter. So those, those fruits and seeds, I didn't say this, but, but the birds that stick around and eat that stuff uh, in the cold months, they are very adaptable birds that can change their diet throughout the course of the year. But we have birds like indigo buntings that go, nope, insects is what I eat and that's what I only eat and I'm not going to stay here in the winter because I have to go find insects in the winter. Um, so, so when it comes to plants, you know, they're not feeding on fruit. They're not looking for seeds. Um, they're just, again, they do nest here. They do nest in the region. Uh, and then they're, they're going to go looking for insects uh, uh, throughout. Um, so I, I can't really be any more specific than that. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, any favorite woodland natives? <laughs> I'll come back to shade again. Um, so, so out, out the window here uh, at the back of the house is one of my most favorite technically woodland plants. Um, although for us and many, many people that I know, it gets in this case a significant amount of morning sun. Uh, and that is the native wild hydrangea. Uh, hydrangea arborescence is the botanical name. Uh, do not get yourself an Annabelle's hydrangea. Do not get one of those pink or or blue hydrangeas. You want simple, perfect, and amazing, uh, and that's hydrangea arborescens. Uh, and it is a woodland shrub. That's where it grows in the wild. But but again, it, it also takes some direct sun. Um, as far as perennials, um, I do really like the coral bells. Uh, there's several species of hookera, uh, the botanical genus, uh, but there's several different species of coral bells. Uh, that, uh, that tolerate lots of different sun conditions, including uh, full shade for several of the species. So there's a couple examples. Great. 
do you have uh, any suggestions for safely controlling ticks? Safely controlling ticks. Um, well, uh, the single biggest uh, factor uh, about tick population wherever you live or, or frequent is going to be deer. Um, uh, deer are the primary vector for ticks completing their life cycle. Uh, and most of us uh, end up, uh, you know, finding ticks or, or getting them on us um, when we're walking in a space or frequenting a space where, where deer have been uh, hanging out. Um, uh, so, you know, th there isn't, uh, you know, there's not like a plant that you could put out that would repel ticks. There's uh, uh, their, their biology doesn't really respond to, to chemical pesticides, which of course we wouldn't be encouraging anyways. So uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot more to say uh, other than deer and ticks go together. The more deer you have, the more ticks you're gonna have. Okay, um, I think that we can make this one our last one. Um, I have a half acre of property. How many birdhouses and what sizes should I have? I do have multiple trees and all have active nests. And I know I now have three birdhouses, but only two uh, were used this year. They were small houses, the smaller houses than the one that was not used was on the side of a tree. So a good question in, in, a, in a longer talk and a more focused talk just about birds or bird gardening. Uh, I do talk about birdhouses a little bit. Um, so with that size of a lot first, it's always worth just pointing out that should you have the opportunity to leave standing dead trees, uh, that's the very best thing uh, for cavity nesting birds because that's what we're talking about with bird houses, right? We're talking about birds that prefer to nest in a natural cavity, um, but they have figured out, they've adapted, they've become accustomed to building their nest in an artificial structure, a birdhouse. Um, so if you can leave, leave uh, uh, standing dead trees or, or, or branches. Um, for birdhouses, uh, there's basically three types. Uh, one would be the biggest, that's a, well, there's, there's technically more than three, but most, most common would be a screech owl box. Um, screech owls are the smallest of our three primary nesting owls. Owls are awesome. Um, and if you've got some large trees, you can mount a screech owl box on one of those trees. Um, bluebird house, if you have any open space nearby, we're also seeing bluebirds, uh, I think, literally adapting to more suburban settings around St. Louis. We're hearing more and more reports of them nesting in neighborhoods we wouldn't have expected. So bluebird house is probably an option for you if you have some open space. And then wren houses, those are the smallest uh, of our uh, cavity nesting uh, bird houses, and there's several different species of songbirds that might nest in a wren house, as well as including our two Carolina and house wrens. Um, so, so those are those are three good ideas. And with that big of, of size, um, I would only do one screech owl box. I might do a couple bluebird houses. You can maybe do them back to back or put them on opposite ends of the lot. And, and the wren houses, you could literally do six, eight, ten wren houses because they can be occupied by different species. Great. Well, Mitch, um, thank you so much for an excellent presentation and for all of your time and energy. Um, Sue, thank you so much for being a liaison and organizing this. Uh, we're so thankful to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.